Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, welcome uh, to this uh, wonderful convention and welcome to my talk. As announced, my uh, name is Tobias Buchborn. I'm currently with Imperial College, a laboratory for neuronal circuit dynamics. Um, and in this laboratory, we are fundamental researchers, so we are interested in the mechan mechanism of action of things, particular uh, in the mechanism of action of psychedelic drugs. And being fundamental researchers, we see ourselves standing in front of this black box. We know that people consume a drug something happens within this black box and all of a sudden people find themselves stuck in some house and uh, <laughs> we, we, are, we, we are interested what happens why people all of a sudden see themselves stuck in some house of course we cannot investigate people stuck in a house but we can investigate animals and they don't really get stuck in a house but they show certain behaviors uh, such as the psychedelic signature move we can have a look at and see what's going on in the black box while the animal engages in this kind of behavior uh, introduction. Um, so if you're interested in the mechanism of action of psychedelics, what do we know very briefly? We know that psychedelics look a little bit like serotonin. As a consequence, they're able to interact with proteins that are part of the serotonin system. And most importantly, there's a protein called serotonin 2A receptor. And when this is being activated in the wrong way, um, you induce a state, an entropic state, that is a characteristic of an entropic psychological state. This is what we know, very briefly. What we only assume is that a certain cell group is important for, for this, and these cells are called pyramidal cells. These are very huge cells which you can find in the outer layer of the brain. Um, you can see them up there. And we assume that they play a role because uh, a lot of human research is based upon EEG and MEG, and they draw the signals from these cells mostly. Unfortunately, neither EEG nor MEG is able to, to differentiate the different layers of the cortex, so it's rather a summated value. Also, fMRI and PET are being used, but they don't really measure neurons themselves. They rather measure uh, blood flow parameters uh, and try to infer from that about the neurons that are underlying. Uh, but as certain energy carcinogens are vasoactive, there's a certain uh, skepti skepticism uh, associated with this. Um, so what we want to do, we want to investigate this uh, psychedelic signature move in rats and we want to use a technique that is called imaging with genetically encoded voltage imaging and this allows us to make neural specific measurements and differentiate them from the blood flow so we can look at both at the very same time to overcome the gaps that, that exist in human research. Um, okay, what is the psych psychedelic signature, uh, signature move? People usually don't call it like that. We just call it here for the Congress like this. Uh, people usually call it shaking behavior or even more common is head switch response or a vet dog shake. Um, people usually measure it in mice or in rats, but it's actually a cross mammalian phenomenon. You find it in dogs and cats, uh, cats and pigs and even in monkeys. Um, it's a rotational movement that occurs along the longitudinal axis of the, of the body and the name wet dog shake uh, derives actually from the fact that it very much looks like a dog shaking like that. So this dog wasn't really treated with a psychedelic, but um, it is being wet and that's why it shakes like it. And believe it or not, this, this behavior, this petty behavior, is the most widely used proxy of central serotonin activity. So whenever people want to learn something about serotonin, they take this behavior as an animal. The reason for this is it is benign is easy quantifiable and it's easy objectifiable. Also, it singles out one specific receptor, namely the serotonin to a receptor. And because it does it, it's of course also very interesting for psychedelic research. Um, here's how it looks in rats actually. Uh, we treated this rat uh, with LSD with a very low dose actually, about uh, seven micrograms uh, this rat received. And if, if you have a look at number three, and at number four and number five, you might be able to guess how it looks, this shake. And if you compare it with the dog, well, there's something to it. <laughs> but it's actually cuter in, 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 uh, in rodents, I can tell you. Um, yeah, there's another reason why psychedelic research I find this more very interesting because there's a lot of research that implies pyramidal cells in it. So pyramidal cells are thought to play a role in psychedelic effect, but they also seem to play a role here. How do we know it? We know that when we knock out the serotonin to ray receptor, animals don't show this behavior anymore. But if you spare some receptors to the pyramidal cells, they would shake again. So this is some evidence that pyramidal cells play a role here. But there's also a conflict going on, namely, if you surgically uh, separate the cortex from the rest of the brain, the animals still shake. And this is rather against the idea that the cortex is irrelevant. And we find this conflict very interesting, and that's why we thought, let's have a look at the pyramidal cells 
in the middle of the animal doing this behavior. Uh, and we do it by using a technique called voltage, a voltage imaging uh, with genetically encoded voltage indicators. So it's an optogenetic method. Um, how do people usually uh, measure neurons? What they usually do is they put an electrode into the cell or, or in the vicinity of the cell and then they stimulate the cell in some way and they apply the drug to it. What you can see here is then is, is such a trace. So the uh, cell gets excited, it overshoots and then it relaxes again. And uh, this process is mediated by channels that sit in the membrane that ought to open up. When these channels open up, they allow positively charge to flow into the cell, and then the cell is very aroused. And then the potassium channel open and allow the positivity to go out again. And as a consequence, the cell can relax. This is the whole process. The problem is we want to measure shaking. Mm -hmm. And if you want to put a lot of electrodes in an animal and then want to sh measure shaking, that's a little bit difficult. Also, of course, we want to measure the muscle activity because we want to compare the behavior output and the brain output. So this would be a whole abundance of electrodes, so we cannot use electrodes here. Yeah. So what, what can we do instead of electrodes? And here, optogenetics come into play. The idea behind optogenetics is that we teach these little channels we just spoke about to send out more the codes to say, hey, I'm, I'm open, hey, I'm closed, that we can see it from the outside that these uh, all, uh, ch channels open, so we don't need any electrodes. That's the vision. Um, how can you do it? The answer is basically genetic engineering. A gene is basically a book. Each gene is a book with one recipe. There's one book uh, with the recipe for the serotonin to A receptor. There's one book with the recipe for the monoamine oxidase. And there's one book for the potassium channel. If you want to add features to the potassium channel, you just have to change the chapter, some chapters in it. This is genetic engineering. And this is basically what the Knöpfer lab did. Um, they looked into nature, found something within the C squared that looks a little bit like the potassium channel. Then they added two fluorophores to it. They also took it from nature, from the crystal jelly and from the bubble tip anemone. Uh, they uh, uh, improved the gain a little bit, so it is able to respond to neurons. And um, they uh, improved the membrane target, targeting of it, so it, it can easily be incorporated into the membrane of the cells. And out came something the Knöpfer lab called butterfly 1-2. This is butterfly 1-2. And this is what we're using to make our measurements. Um, how does butterfly work? So this is a membrane and uh, the butterfly is a protein that sits within the membrane of such a permeable cell and there are two fluorophores attached to it and when the cell is not active these fluorophores are far away from, an, from one another. We stimulate this one and as a consequence it sends out a very strong signal. This only sends, sends out the weak one but when the cell gets activated, there is a steric rearrangement within the protein, and these two proteins, <laughs> these fluorophores, come closer together. And as a consequence, the acceptor steals energy of the donor, and the red one now becomes more dominant than the green one. So basically, this is what we measure, the shift. Here, in the in unactivated state, this one is more dominant, and here, this one is more dominant. And uh, how that works, you actually see under C, you see when, when, when the slice preparation is being activated, you see the M-citrine, the uh, donor going down, and the M-K going up. This is what I just described. And to be sure that this is really voltage, um, they also check for local field potential. And as you can see, it measures the same thing. So we can use light instead of electrons. Um, there's another benefit of the design of this butterfly. Because of the two fluorophores, the donor sends out a signal that is susceptible to be absorbed by hemo hemoglobin within the blood. And as a consequence, there are oscillations uh, in a pulse synchronous manner. And if we extract these, we actually can also tell something about the blood flow. So we have voltage signals and we have blood signals. And we can measure it syn synchronously. Um, the next question is, now that we know how butterfly works, how do we target it to the cells? Um, we decided here for layer 2 or 3 permeable cells. This might be confusing to some people because there's a lot of interest in layer, layer 5. Uh, we decided for these cells because, as you can see here, at the apicodendrite of a layer 3 permeable cells, they also express the serotonin to A receptor. Not as much as the 5 ones, but we think 
um, we want to add another piece, a uh, puzzle piece to the overall picture, to have a holistic picture, we started with these cells. And we now need to make sure that, that this butterfly is only expressed by these cells, non other cells, not in the liver, not in the kidney, not in the hippocampus, just these cells. And how do we do it? Um, you see this one. Here is the butterfly gene, and here's a stop before it. And here is the one that keeps, that starts the butterfly. So um, the stop needs to be cut away, and this needs to be started. So what we now do, we give this, the scissors, the enzymatic scissors, to cut away the stop only to layer two and three. And we give the starting signal only to pure myocells. So only in the interse intersection of both, namely in layer five, uh, layer two, three pure male cells, butterfly is being expressed. This is called intersectional genetic targeting. So we no, don't need any surgery, no opening of the skull, we do it in a genetic way. Um, the next, uh, this is the last slide about the methods. Um, the next thing uh, we, we have to check is how do we record the video, uh, the, the movement of the animals, and we did it quite simply. Again, we don't want to use any electrodes. We instead videotape the animal, zoom into the animal, and then translate the pixel variation in the video in such traces. Here you actually see butterfly. The red one is the brain signal, and the black one is the video signal, and you see that they neatly overlap so we can synchronize the brain activity with what the animals are doing. And the drug we are using is also a new one. We don't use LSD. We use, uh, use a drug that is called 25CN and MBOH. It's a phenethylamine like mescaline. The red part is an overlap with mescaline. And we use this drug because it's very, very selective. Most um, serotonergic hallucinogens interact with a lot of receptors, and this creates a lot of uh, pharmacodynamic noise in the brain we don't want to have. We are only interested in a serotonin to a receptor. That's why we're using this new drug. Um, okay, results. Here you um, see the results of the videotape. This is actually how a videotape mouse looks like. We have a frontal perspective on the mouse. In the video, we can define regions of interest, like around the ears or around the, the chest. Also, we have a tail perspective. And then we can measure when the animals twitch and here you see the twitch, the right ear twitch, the left ear twitch, and the tail would twitch. We also have the chest and the back. And what we learn from this uh, slide is that the twitch is very brief. It only lasts around 100 milliseconds. This is what you see up there. Very important to define the behavior before we go into the brain. The next thing is the question, how quick is it actually? Uh, when you look under A, you again see the twitch in the time domain, and we put a sinusoid on it. And here you can uh, um, approximate, just by looking at how many cycles occur in 100 milliseconds, that the twitch is about um, 30 to 40 hertz. Um, and to be more exact, we did a Fourier transformation. This is what you see down here. This is a spectrogram of two twitches of the ear. And the peak represents amplitudes of the twitch. And if you look at the, at the peak and see the frequency, then you see the frequency is indeed as predicted ab uh, about 30 to 50 hertz. So this is the gamma frequency range, very quickly. Um, yeah. The next question is, OK, when animals show this behavior, what is going on in the brain? And there's already some research that has been done with DOI, and they use local feed potential. So they did use electrodes. It's not impossible, but there are limitations to it. And what, what they found is that at around the time when people show a lot of twitching, there's an increase in low frequency oscillations. They didn't really synchronize it with the individual events, but they said around the time there's a data increase. And we, we, we thought, let's, let's check for that. Oops. Um, and here you see it, we have our regions of interest. This is the left motor cortex. And what you can see, the um, pink line is where the twitch occurs, PSM. And around embedded, the twitch is embedded in a nice data peak. So we also find this data peak, and we find it synchronized with the twitch. Now you might ask, hmm, the data is quite slow. It's only four, four hertz. Why would the body do something slow when the animal does something quick? That doesn't fit, does it? And that's why we next checked whether there's also quick activity going on in the brain, and indeed there is. Uh, here is the left motor cortex. The pink line is again where the twitch occurs, and you see right before the twitch, there's a nice and very widespread uh, peak in gamma in between um, 
um, 30 and 45 hertz, which basically mirrors the twitch frequency range. And if you look at the right uh, motor cortex, you see this peak somehow vanishing and emerging into the execution of the actual behavior. Hmm? Um, the next question is, okay, now we have this activity. We have the delta activity, we have the gamma activity. W what, what does it actually mean? And to, to, to get an idea what it means, it's, it's a good idea to recheck the video more closely. And this is what we did. This is uh, the whole body movement of the animal. So the whole body was used as a region of interest. And so the animal was moving. And this moving can be approximated by a delta peak. And this delta peak, don't we remember such a, a delta peak? Have we seen that before? Yes, we have, namely in the motor cortex. That means at the very mo moment when animals show a behavior that has a delta-like activity, you find a delta peak in the motor cortex. So that implies that the delta peak, which is rather slow, is not really associated with the, with the quick twitch, but rather with the overall initiation, with the limb movement. And to check that further, we made region-specific uh, analysis of the limbs of the animals. So we had a region of interest uh, for the forelimb, for the back limb, and as you can see, indeed, uh, here again, this uh, um, pink line is the twitch. Surrounding the twitch, the animal shows limb movements, and these are most likely the source of this uh, data peak. But what about the, the gamma then? Is there also something that can explain the, ga uh, the gamma? We again looked into the videos, and uh, what we found is that you indeed see the twitch, but at around the time where you find this peak in the motor cortex, there is nothing. You see this lining, this dotted lining. There's nothing that could explain the gamma peak. And we also uh, checked for the mouth because the mouth is very dominantly represented in the motor cortex, just to be sure. Same situation. Although you see the twitch, at the time where the gamma peak occurs, there's nothing that could account for it. And this it makes it very, very likely that the gamma peak is related to the twitch itself because there's nothing else that could explain it. And because it's a precedence uh, to the twitch, it makes it even more interesting. OK. Uh, beyond p um, uh, neuronal activity, we, are, we were also interested in blood flow changes. And um, in a separate line of investigation, we checked for the blood flow within neck arteries. Uh, with a, a, a carotid artery because it supplies the brain with, with blood. And what we find is that when we apply our NBOH, there's a drug, it depends a little bit on the, on the overall setting, um, that you have a massive uh, increase in blood volume just at the base of the brain. So this is the first evidence that one should not um, sneeze at the activity when it comes to psychedelic drug action. But now we were also interested in, uh, interested in uh, whether we would find changes in the brain now that we've seen it um, in, in neck arterial areas. And again, we have our region of interest. It's the left motor cortex. Pink line is the twitch again. And you see that right before the twitch occurs, there's a increase in the dominance of the pu pulse on the signal, which means that right before the animals engage in this behavior, the blood the volume seems to be increased, or at least uh, the blood has more e power uh, at this instant. So um, unlike fMRI and uh, unlike EEG and these kind of things, we can um, separate these two measurements and look at them in parallel. That's basically it from my side, a, a wrap up. Um, we intersectionally target our voltage sensitive uh, protein to layer two, three per mile cells. Um, this butterfly is able to emit light, a red one and a greenish one. This we can record. We apply a new selective serotonin 2A agonist to reduce the pharmacodynamic noise of non-serotonin 2A receptors. Um, we observe the twitching, the psychedelic signature move, turn it into traces by um, translating the pixel variations into, into graphs, and then we synchronize things. And we don't need any electrodes. We don't need to open any brain. Uh, we just measure light. And uh, thereby, we are able to uh, measure the synchrony of neuro, hemo, and behavioral dynamics. And what we find is um, 
that there's a motor cortical peak in high frequency oscillations, uh, which is likely to represent the twitch because there's nothing else in the motor output that could account for it. Also, we find an increase in flow, uh, slow frequency oscillation, which is likely to be associated with the limb movements because they are as slow as is this delta activity. And we find an increase in blood flow dominance on the signal. Um, so this might feed in with the neuronal needs. So of course, if you engage in something, you need energy, you need supply, you need oxygen. So this might feed in with this. Um, we cannot discuss things in detail, but just some things to have in mind. We already know from, from certain papers, this layer two, three per mile cells respond to psychedelics in vivo and in vitro. So this is in line with what we find. What you also have to keep in mind is that these cells don't project to the spinal cord. They don't pro project to the brainstem, but they project to the striatum, which is involved in behavior. And they also project to the layer five per mile cells, um, which are then the output neurons of the cortex. So if if these cells are somehow involved in the initiation or modulation of this behavior, then it must be an indirect effect. But an alternative could also be that they just represent that this thing is happening, so it can be coordinated with other things in the cortex. Mm -hmm. This is particularly interesting, this version, because we know that if you connect, disconnect the cortex from the rest of the brain, we mentioned that before, the shaking still occurs. In terms of the blood flow, I think it's important to point out that serotonin to A receptors can be found in a lot of cells that are important for blood flow. You very f often find them in the muscle cells that, that wrap around the vessels and they constrict it. Um, we know, at least in mice, that serotonin to A receptors can be found in the circle of villus, which is the hub at the base of the brain and supplies the brain with blood. Uh, and we also know that I think the capillaries uh, are wrapped with um, glial cells, which also express it. So I mention this and I stress this because um, I think it's important to indeed uh, keep that in mind when analyzing fMRI, uh, fMRI data. Here's some suggested reading. If you're interested in the method, you might want to read uh, the Knöpfel paper. He's uh, the engineer of the butterfly uh, we were using here. Um, the Lardo Belfort uh, article is, gives a nice overview of the neurophysiology of serotonergic hallucinogens, uh, particularly in animals. Um, um, no research is a one man show, although I'm standing here, so I would like to give credit to people who are involved in this project. Um, I would like to thank uh, Thomas Knöpfel, who is the, the head of the lab and who is the designer of this Wunderwerk of the Butterfly 1 2. I would like to thank, uh, say thanks to the rest of the team, particularly Taylor Lyons, who collected all the data with me and who is a dear friend, Shen Shen Song, who put a lot of effort into establishing the method. I would like to say thanks to David Nutt and to Robin Card Hulse for being a huge inspiration for me and uh, two of the main reasons why I actually came to London. Um, I would like to say thanks to the rest of the psychedelic team for providing an environment of growth, discussion and friendship. Um, and the funders, of course, the European Commission who entrusted me with the Marie Curie uh, Fellowship. Um, also um, an example that an integrative Europe is, is a good thing. Um, I would like to say thanks to the Beckley Foundation and Manda Feeding who also supported us and uh, uh, um, financially and intellectually uh, making this project a part of the Beckley Imperial Psychedelic Research Program. That's it from my side. Thank you.